Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Delmar, together with my co-host Mark Vornich at Statewide News Service, jbiztechvalley.com. And as you can see here, he is now the columnist for the Jewish Press. Right, I'm having a lot of fun doing all of that. And uh, today, Rabbi, we have a very serious topic that really is uh, gut-wrenching and really tugs on the heartstrings. Uh, we're going to talk about child uh, sex abuse victims. I'm sure we And we certainly have uh, two guests with us today. We have Manny Wax, who is, lives in Israel. Yes. Originally from Australia. Yes. And you're the chief executive officer of Kol Oz, and you are a child sex abuse survivor. Correct. So, you know, congratulations on being a survivor and getting over it. But I'm sorry to hear about the fact that this happened to you. Uh, so many years, a lot. we'll get into how many years ago it was. And we also have with us today, Dr. Sharon Greenberg. Weiss Greenberg. Weiss Greenberg. Yeah. And with Jofa. But to be extra Jewish, you know. <laughs> a double Jewish name over here. Yeah. Jofa is the uh, Jewish Orthodox, or Orthodox Fem Feminist Alliance. Here we could now, see it here, their magazine. That's now, right. Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance, is that an oxymoron? Feminist yeah. Orthodox. I would hope that we wouldn't choose an oxymoron for the name of our organization. Well, um, but, but, mo but you've heard that before. Maybe. Rhetorically. Rhetorically, yes, okay. Yes. So how did, you know, what is the mission of JOFA? We seek to advance um, the role of women and advocate for social change in terms of gender issues in the Orthodox community. And we believe that in doing so, in empowering women as leaders and in giving women opportunities and ritual that we will better the Orthodox community So are, are you in favor of this concept of open orthodoxy that Avi Weiss is promoting? Um, Rabbi Avi Weiss married me. Okay. <laughs> My husband is a musmach of Yeshiva Tchobe Torah. I, I believe that all orthodoxy is meant to be open and inclusive. I think that's the true spirit of of what it has been since its inception, not too long ago in the 1800s or so, um, because obviously orthodoxy, the terms that we use are, are innovation. So this right. is a new term to reflect the values of openness and inclusivity. Um, I could identify as open orthodox or modern orthodox or orthodox. Those are all labels that I would feel comfortable with. Okay, and when did you start the group? Jofa. Yeah. Jofa began um, 19 years ago. In 1997, there were four women sitting in Blue Greenberg's living room. She's the founding president of Jofa. And no relation to you. No relation, no relation. and no relation to Rabbi Weiss. And right. that happens sometimes yeah. that people think that there's a lot of nepotism. There's no nepotism. Right. Um, but there were four women sitting in a room thinking about discussing issues that they had within the community, frustrations that they had, feeling like they didn't have a voice, that they didn't really matter, that they couldn't... Right. You know, they have living very, uh, they, they were leaders in the community at large and really feeling like something's missing and the Orthodox community yeah. is missing out on that. And um, so they had a conference and then over 1,400 people came. Wow. So Jofa was founded. Because when I went to the Orthodox Union biennial convention, mm -hmm. which was two Decembers ago, so it was I was there. 2014. Oh, and that's where you look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the, I mean, they had some groundbreaking. Uh, yes. resolutions to accept for accepting women beyond where it was before you know yes they so. they had a, a new mission to empower women as lay leaders they had I forgot how many but numerous vice mm -hmm. presidents um, who were serving who were women vice presidents yeah. and they had a mission to promote within the Orthodox Union, women into senior leadership positions. I, I actually used to work for the OU. I was a, I was a JLIC um, educator at Harvard. And um, at the time, I be, I'm told that there was only one woman in, senior, in a senior leadership position at the OU, and now I'm told that there are many more. And the OU has also began to, to be listed along with AWP's Better Work, Better Life campaign, where they provide paid maternity leave for their employees. Wow. So the OU has has come a long way in they a short seen, period of time. They've seen the light. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so are you pleased with the way the OU is moving? And, and does this make you even more passionate, bring you closer to the to being involved with the OU? And, you know. Yes, yeah, so I'm someone who has worked for a number of years for the OU, yeah. and I support the work they do. I think um, 
They believe in the big tent mission, open tent, if you will. Um, and I think that um, the, the notion of allowing women a place, is, it's, it seems very dated to even use that sort of a language. Uh -huh. It's obvious, of course, we want women serving as leaders and being empowered and making decisions. We're the most well-educated generation of women in the history of the Jewish people. Well, you see, I remember the, there were old synagogues where they had balcony, where the yes. women would sit up in the balcony. Right. And there were two reasons I heard for that. One was the women were closer to Hashem, okay. and <laughs> they were uh, more revered, so they were higher up. And then they could also look down over the balcony and make sure their husband is where they should, where he should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, that was those are the two. You know, Mark really, okay. you know, put it into a Torah perspective. Yes, the Torah do. is thirty three hundred years old. That women have always been traditionally major leaders. I mean, not to get into a whole Bible class here, which I probably would like to do, but if we don't have the time for it right now, it's not the place. But I mean, Esther, we have Purim's story. Devorah. She was a leader. We had um, Devorah. Devorah, the prophetess, was a leader. So I mean, again, we can yeah, go on and on, really. Like I say, it could be a whole class, a seminar of women throughout Jewish history or throughout the Bible where that they were major leaders. So I think that just to even put that perspective, Judaism never put down or made like women second class citizens no. as other religions you know, had and did, uh, even today. But um, they did have a humble role. And, and I think, you know, Judaism, even though that, you know, was based on basic Torah values, but there is a little leeway, that's what you were saying, for modern day. I mean, I, again, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, for example, learning the Talmud. So the Talmud is like literally learning law. You know, one says this, one says this, and you can get confused. And uh, you know, when I teach the Talmud, what's the bottom line? Tell me that they're arguing the whole time they're arguing. And the women were generally not uh, learning Talmud because they didn't have the kind of frame of reference in learning. And now the Rebbe's saying, well, there's women in law schools. I think more than half of the law schools are women today students in the United in States, school, students yeah. in law schools. And uh, so they're learning. That's actually what law is. The defense says this, the uh, prosecution says this, and what should you do? So he says, well, if they're having that frame of reference of that mindset of knowing how to argue, then, then let them learn the Talmud. So the Rebbe himself was very innovative, and a lot of it reflects, like you say, on society. I mean, there are limits of what society will allow. You know, the, the society almost allows anything but anything in society, and Torah obviously has very strict guidelines and other issues, but like I say, there is leeway, and I think the Rebbe also was very innovative, saying, hey, this is a different society, we're in America, you don't want to break those guidelines of Torah. On the other hand, you know, there is ways to, to adjust Torah to the situation and, today. And if you'll excuse me, women do know how to argue. <laughs> we do it all the time, very effectively. So it's also interesting now. There's a trend within some of the ultra orthodox communities where they're not printing the images of women in newspapers and what have you. And in the Lubavitcher Rebbe, you see pictures of his wife in, in Jewish bookstores, bookstores in Crown Heights and what have you. And he insisted that when you have publications, this is what I'm told. You can yeah, correct me if sure. I'm wrong. That both girls and boys are tziva you know, Yeah, no, for sure. That once they. They tell a story where there's a magazine for Jewish kids and they had the boys doing something. The rabbi sent it, you know, they sent it to the rabbi, you know, does it look good? And he says, where's the girls? So he specifically mm -hmm. wanted the girls and the women have a woman convention and women have a tremendous leadership role. And it's a little bit more Mark was kind of hinting to, if anything, the women are not second class citizens, they're really behind the men, they're together with them, they're pushing them. Sometimes the men are behind the women. That's yeah. Right. So well, the women are leaders in a certain they sense, are. you know. So when it comes to child sex abuse mm -hmm. victims or survivors, or how, how did you get involved in this? Because you're not one of, you're not in that category. So basically, you know, there's a certain, there's certain thing, you know, pillars of what Jofa, Jofa focuses on. Um, but there's, there are issues, many issues that are, are somewhat related to rabbinic authority. And I think oftentimes within the Orthodox community, things, victims, stories, perpetrators are protected 
and the power dynamic allows for that. Um, so um, two years ago, shortly after the OU convention, it was right before. It was um, December, it was of, December so of 14. 14, so it was Oct October that Barry Freundell's um, taking advantage of women, many women, hundreds of women came, came to the fore. Um, and it became very clear, although it was clear to many of us beforehand, it became clear to society at large that when you give, when you centralize power and you give a great amount of power to an individual that they could take advantage of the situation. Okay. Barry Freindel? Barry Freindel, okay, you, Freindel, the former head of the GPS system, the conversion system for the RCA. Um, so arguably one of the most powerful rabbis in America. Um, Where was he from? He was from Washington, D.C. Okay. And he... And he sexually abused women. He... Is that what you're saying? He, he, he watched... He, he, he took women to the mikvah before converting to do a practice dunk. Right. He had cameras installed in the mikvah. Right. And had thousands of recordings of them. He right. also engaged in, in sexual misconduct with, with some of them. They're, they're, the stories kept on coming. I, I don't know that I'm up to date on all of them because at some point... Right, you, you become numb with all this. It's too much. And, and then that's how, so from that instance, that's how you... Yeah, really I mean, I think there, I think it's, imp I, I think in general, uh, individuals having a great amount of power and seeing themselves as being untouchable is a problem. I think that everyone should have checks and balances no matter their gender. Um, but specifically when it comes to conversion, 90% of converts are women. And really? I didn't even know that. Of Orthodox converts, according to the RCA. I don't know what that means. And, um, and it would be very appropriate to have women being involved in, in fairly delicate issues. Um, and I think in general that having women clergy makes a lot of sense. Um, certainly give, for the pastoral needs that, that women may have that may, they may not want to come to a male rabbi for. Um, sometimes there's certain laws, like the laws of nida, of menstruation and family purity, where it's, it's inappropriate in my eyes to bring a pair of underwear to, to a male rabbi. I think that um, part of what we're doing is we're saying that, um, A, many women want to speak to women about certain issues. They want to be able to have right. a hug of support, and you can't necessarily have those things from a male rabbi. But you got the rabbits and, and as a former unpaid rabbit's in, <laughs> um, I'll get to that in a second, but B, I think that you're losing out on half of the community uh -huh. um, and talent that wants to serve. Um, as a former Robinson and former JLIC, I can tell you that when I did JLIC, I was paid for the work that I did. I was, I was compensated and, and valued, and yes. I think as someone with multiple graduate degrees and someone who's, you know, countless hours, well beyond what I was actually paid for, um, I, I, I think that is important to me to, to be valued in that sort of way. But also, the, I shouldn't, you shouldn't have to be married to a rabbi in order to serve the community. There are some women who, on their own, want to be servants of God, and they want to go ahead and serve the community, and they should not be allowed to do that unless they marry a rabbi. That's a fairly limiting um, way to reach your career. I don't think that a woman should have to marry a certain person to, to, to do what she wants to do. I know, so, just, you know, I ask questions just yeah. to hear you say it out right. of your words, not that I'm counteracting <laughs> you at all. So. Okay. I mean, again, I mean, I don't know, I wish my wife would be here, actually, because she can answer a lot of the things that, I mean, she just feels that women do have their major role. A little, a few things, maybe not, maybe rule on, on Jewish law. I mean, maybe she'd be trained, she'd be able to. The women have a advisory, you know, women come to my wife constantly. So I think the Chabad model really is probably the most empowering of women, certainly within the ultra-Orthodox community. Um, at the same time, let's say your wife married someone who wasn't a rabbi. Let's say you, did, you weren't a rabbi and she wanted to, to teach and she wanted to, to be in that sort of role. Um, wouldn't it make sense for her to be able to do that and to have a proper education that she could feel confident in going ahead and giving halachic advice or pastoral advice? There, there, there are opportunities in Chabad for that anyway. Yeah, right. there is. And, and wouldn't you be called, wouldn't you gravitate towards the conservative reform movements if you wanted to do that? Isn't that why we have the big tent? Because well, if you... 
I think it's easy to say, you know, you could say the same thing about giving divrei Torah in the vernacular in synagogues. That was a reform innovation that we've all taken on. Not we've all, there are still many communities where they still speak Yiddish, but there's certain innovations within the realm of halacha that you take on. And um, from a range of rabbis, even within the centrist Orthodox world, the modern Orthodox world, the RCA world, even some of the ultra-Orthodox world, I've been told it would be a it would be impossible to argue that a woman cannot have smicha, given what smicha is today, that a woman... Smicha means rabbinical ordination yes. for her Yes. Okay, so now we want to bring in Danny, because he's sitting here so patiently, <laughs> yeah. and I just want to make it's sure Interesting that, conversation. I'm you know, happy to listen. It is stimulating, and I thank you for that. I appreciate that perspective. But, Manny, uh, t tell me uh, what happened, how old were you? And when this, uh, when, how, what age of a child were you when you had, when you were sexually abused? Sure. Before I do that, I think it's yeah. also very important to um, be careful in the type of language we use. For example, if we uh, assume that someone who deals in the topic, uh, just because they have not necessarily shared that they had been abused, um, we've got to be careful about asking them uh, those types of questions because they may indeed be a victim but have not shared it for whatever reason. Um, and, and also in the other comment that struck me as well in the early, um, the early part of this uh, interview was also around getting over it. Um, yeah, well done for getting over it. And I think we need to be careful around that because uh, just because I am uh, a survivor, not that I, I don't particularly like that term and I'm happy to explain why in a moment, but uh, I've gone on, I've married, I've got kids, I've got a job and, and those types of things doesn't necessarily that I'm mean that I'm over it. Right. It's something that remains with you, or at least with many victims and survivors that I deal with, certainly my, with me, um, it, it does remain with you pretty much for a lifetime. Um, and so what happened? So back, back to your question, I mean, I, I was uh, sexually abused at the age, from the age of about 11. Uh, I grew up um, in a Chabad community in, in Australia, in Melbourne, and uh, I've got uh, 16 brothers and sisters, so I've got a very large family. Um, and uh, there were two perpetrators in my case. Uh, they were both affiliated with the Yeshiva Chabad community in, in Australia. One of the perpetrators is uh, currently sitting in jail in, in Australia. He was held to account, and the other one is free in New York. Um, some of the abuse happened, actually, the first abuse, the first time I was ever sexually abused, happened inside a synagogue. Um, you were talking about before uh, with the women sitting up stairs and men downstairs. You know, so for me, that's where it happened. It happened actually in the women's section on on Shavuot night, one of the Jewish festivals, where it's customary to remain awake all night to study the Torah. Um, and uh, I went upstairs for some, some a time out, a break, to lie down. And uh, the my perpetrator, the first perpetrator, followed me up and sexually abused me inside the synagogue, um, and then eventually felt a little bit guilty about it, not sexually abusing, but sexually abusing inside the synagogue. So he uh, suggested we go outside, and again, as an 11-year-old kid, um, I followed him, and, and that continued there. And uh, one of the other play times, uh, I w by the second perpetrator, I was actually abused uh, repeatedly in different areas, but one of the times that, that sticks in my mind is uh, uh, the abuse I endured inside a male mikvah, uh, ritual bath, cleansing place. And, uh, spiritual place and um, I used to go there as a Chabadnik you go there every morning uh, before prayers and then on uh, Fridays and before Jewish festivals you go twice so obviously that came a bit of a shock to me where you have a certain reverence uh, yeah. for a place and perhaps even the, the, the person who ends up abusing you and, and that How that's, old were you in the I would have been about um, 14 something like 14. that 14 yeah. and then was this that was the second perpetrator. Right. So the gentleman who is who's in New York now. No, that's the know? that's the second perpetrator who second did the mikvah, and he's in jail. The first perpetrator is in New York. Is in New York. Okay. Yes. So the, for, uh, when you talk about the incident in the mikvah, was it just one incident? Um, that was the biggest one that I remember. But with him, the perpetrator, uh, the second perpetrator, happened repeatedly. He was also a karate teacher. Uh, he was in charge of security at the uh, institution. It's not just the school; it's the, the center. It's called the yeshiva center, and under that, they've got a yeshiva college, Bethrifka College, which is a boys and a girls school. They've got the yeshiva synagogue. They've got uh, Chabad youth. So, a range of organizations. And how old was he? 
Uh, they were both in their early 20s. Early 20s? Yes, so, so 10 years older. So to them, they didn't see much of an age difference, I guess, but you're still a minor, and you still shouldn't force yourself on someone just because you want to. And you just froze? You just didn't know what to do? Or Firstly, I mean, um, it's not about the age difference. Uh, an 11-year-old kid, a 12-year-old kid yeah. going through puberty, I don't think a 20-year-old kid can, uh, or even older than that, can somehow confuse um, those types of boundaries. Okay. They are pedophiles. Right. They, are, they are sexually attracted to children. Right. Uh -huh. And in relation to the second pedophile who's currently in jail, he's sitting now in jail in relation to nine victims. Oh, okay. To nine boys, nine. yes. He sexually abused nine, for which he was convicted. There are other victims as well that I'm aware of. Sure. So what, they are what I would refer as pedophiles. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, when, so what was your reaction when... Oh, you did, sorry, you asked me about the, the, the freezing. Um, most cases of sexual abuse don't happen randomly. You remember the concept, I think, when, certainly when I grew up, it was all about stranger danger. And that's where the, the biggest danger lies. Uh, and that's completely false. Uh, because the vast majority of cases uh, of sexual abuse, the victim uh, knows the perpetrator. Right. Uh, often there is some relationship. The majority of cases, mind you, happen within the family environment, right. uh, whether it's an uncle, a, a grandparent, a stepdad. So there are a lot of misconceptions out there around that. Uh, but what happens, typically, there is a gro grooming process that happens. So uh, that means that uh, it's not as if this person, whether or not he knows his victim, uh, suddenly goes and sexually molests them, abuses them. It doesn't happen very rarely. Usually, it's for seeing what they need, what they're lacking, whether it's gifts, whether it's money, whether it's love, whether it's attention, a range of things for every kid something may be missing. And if there's nothing obvious, then they'll move on to find that vulnerable child. And of course, in my case, very large family, grew up within a Chabad environment, there's a lot of trust towards other fellow community members. Uh, and people of the same sex. Well, there's a lot of interaction within now, the same sex. Most of your 16 siblings were uh, boys? Or? They, they were. I think that, that's, that's less of a relevance. Well, I mean, no, yes, because you feel more comfortable let's say changing clothes in front of a, in front of another boy you feel yeah. you know more comfortable well the interaction is with the same sex in, you don't interact with the opposite sex that's yeah. full stop no, you don't yeah so that's why i'm yeah. asking you know that maybe this was oh this is familiar so this is nothing yeah. you know but yeah did you know i mean from age 11 till 14 were you struggling with what this man did to you? Well, at the time, I didn't realize that I was struggling with it um, in, in, in my behavior. I mean, the behavior I was exhibiting, I was rebelling against religion, for example. Uh -huh. uh, you know, Bar Mitzvah was completely disinterested in, in, in the religious component of it. You know, I remember I was very excited in, initially to, to, to become a man within the Chabad community. It's a very um, important and, and prestigious almost in terms of you get your hat, you get your suit, mm -hmm. you get your, you know, to fill in, you become one of the community members right. in a real sense. Um, I wasn't really interested. I didn't, I skipped um, uh, prayer services. I Was it because you were abused, you think? Look, it, I mean, like it turned you off to the whole community? Uh, I think that, you know, you, you, you can never know. I may have behaved in a certain way, if, even if I wasn't abused, I don't know. But all but I know is... Uh, yes, absolutely, yeah, okay. I did give up Mitzvah. Uh, but I certainly was completely disinterested in the religious components, in the religious aspects of, of, of life. Mm -hmm. um, I forced myself to eat no kosher, I, even though it was very uncomfortable. I mean, I e, traif, you know, I remember that, that would have been already at the age of 15, a bit later, but it was, I forced myself to, to, to turn the light off on Shabbat, even though it was like, you know, one of the worst, motiumat, you will, it's a death penalty in the Bible for turning lights off or desecrating Shabbat. And for me, I didn't think I was going to get struck down and, and die, but it was, it really did speak to me in that way. It was very uh, compelling. Uh, compelling, absolutely. A little bit that, you know, what Mark was saying, I know that, you know, when Mark said it also, that you never get over such a thing like that. But maybe you go back and... Um, no, number one, maybe you should, the first question is that when a person's in jail, did that make you feel better? I mean, they always no. say that with crime victims, like saying, finally the guy, you know, they caught him and 
threw him in the can and good for him. It, no, no, no. I don't, I don't feel that way about any, not my victim, and not my perpetrator, sorry, and not uh, any other um, perpetrators that I see go through this process. For me, it's really about justice and accountability. I'm happy to leave that to the, in the hands of the judges to make a determination. I have faith in the system. Let them do that. Okay, so let me ask you about the, um, about the base din. Sure. Did you want, since there's no, um, there's uh, no statute of limitations in the Jewish religion, yeah. did you go to a base din? Did you want to go to a base din? The vast majority of victims, uh, firstly, don't ever disclose the abuse they endured. And then those few who do, and they are few um, statistically, uh, they do so decades later. By that time, I disclosed my abuse at the age of 20. Uh, by that time, I was secular, had absolutely no interest in religion, and certainly okay. not, not in a bet in. So that was never an option uh, as soon for me. When I heard about it, I simply, I happened to hear on the radio, uh, Operation Paradox in Australia, it was, if you have any information about child sexual abuse, report it to the authorities. For some reason, until that moment, I had never even considered going to the authorities. Suddenly the penny dropped. I went straight away to my father and, and told him what had happened. Uh, and to his credit, he contacted the police. You and told you, you told your father, not your mother? Correct. Could you have told your mother? I don't think so. It's okay. still a topic that we, don't, we rarely discuss. Okay. It's, um, yeah, there is that. But now distance. you're in Albany because that's where our studio is. And uh, what brings you to Albany all the way from Australia? <laughs> well, for, I want, well, no, from Israel. We're in right. Israel. That's right. Well, we left Australia just over a year ago. We spent some time in France and we moved to Israel. I made Aliyah just a few months ago in Ramat Sharon, which is north of Tel Aviv, right next to Herzliya. Um, and I've come to uh, Albany, especially for um, the lobbying day uh, that was put together by Assemblywoman uh, Mar Marge Markey, and that is really focusing on the statute of limitations issue in New York State, which is absolutely appalling. As I mentioned before, it takes decades, often, in most cases, for victims to come forward. And in New York, the statute of limitations effectively is the age of 23. So once you pass that age, you cannot bring your perpetrator or the institution that uh, uh, enabled them to account. Not a civil case, not a criminal case. That needs to change. It needs to be eliminated and it needs to be completely, um, excuse me, open now, uh, yeah, to address it. Are you still secular? Yes, I am. Okay. And your wife? Look, I, I generally, as, as an activist, as a victim, I don't discuss my, uh, my wife and my kids. Uh, I can say I'm married with three children, beautiful children, uh, but um, they... And they're in Israel. They are in Israel, okay. that's correct. So let me ask you about the... Um, uh, Agudas Israel is one of the uh, organizations that oppose this change in the statute of limitations. Do you know why? Do you, did, has anyone told you why? Do you know why? I mean, sure. Um, and not only that, Aguda also uh, still has part of their policy that a victim uh, or anyone with information about sexual abuse needs to go to a rabbi first rather than going directly to the police. That needs to change. Um, as to why they do it, I think it's more a question should be directed to them. Uh, okay. for, in, in terms of the statute of limitations, there's, I've seen on the public record they have said it, that uh, one concern is about institutions, religious institutions, potentially becoming bankrupted by um, lawsuits. Kind of like the church. That's bankrupt. correct. The, the Catholic Church has made similar um, allegations or, or a fee campaign that that may happen. Um, personally, uh, I don't believe that that would be the case. Secondly, um, victims and survivors have endured a great deal of pain no. and they deserve justice, including the opportunity to be compensated. And uh, it's not about money for them, but it's about justice and accountability. And with part of that money, they do need, many of them, go see therapy on a regular basis. And you sought therapy? Absolutely. I still under, undergo a great deal of therapy. Still today? Still today, day. absolutely. In fact, the therapy that I started, I didn't commence it back then for a whole host of reasons. I wasn't ready. My Chabad upbringing never encouraged right. seeing therapy. It was really look, uh, frowned upon in many ways. Um, but I have started it more, you know, in probably the most serious way in the last uh, few months. Now, did your wife encourage you to do this? Again, I'd rather leave my wife out of it. No, but it's, I'm saying, was it a... Was it a 
uh, as far as a family member, as far as someone you're close to. My, my you know, wife has. I don't mean. Yes, no, I understand. What, but look, my wife has always been supportive in, in, in looking after my uh, well mental health and my well being. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, whatever is needed, uh, that's something that I need yeah, to yeah, do. Yeah, that's all that's I correct. Is that, you know, yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, in fact, I mean, that's what I want to do myself as well, to look after my and own. you're probably even more protective of your children now than your parents were of you. Absolutely. Not overprotective. Thankfully, my wife is, is very grounded, and I feel that I am as well. We use my experience and my story to incorporate that in the education process for the children. Do you know why Agudath Israel is opposed to this change? I want to just okay. follow what, what was just being said. I yeah. think that um, today's world is different than our parents' generation. Yes. We're far more aware that these things happen. And one thing that was coming to mind throughout today was we have the laws of Yehud um, in, in Orthodox Judaism that a man, that, that you can't be alone, two individuals. And it starts at a very young age, at the age of three. And about 20 years ago, I was having a conversation with a colleague of mine. I was teaching at Yeshiva University High School for Girls. And the students were complaining, like, how messed up that is. Why would it be at age three? Um, and I responded, even if it just saves one three-year-old from abuse, that's why it's there, that, that the laws that were instituted within our religion um, over a millennia ago were really right. there to protect. And right. I think that's a, a, a very strong value to, to, to do the best that we can to save that one soul, that right. one person from going through what you went through. Um, so I, I okay. thought that was important to share. Yes. And do you know why Agudath Israel is opposing? I, I think I've read the same sorts of, of things. I, I would imagine um, that. Uh, unfortunately, I think I, I think primarily they're putting their interests and the interests of. Of, of their institutions above the interests of victims. And that's what I said earlier at the press conference, that it's time that we put the interests and well-being of victims and survivors and their families ahead of the interests and the well-being of the perpetrators and their enablers. Now, this is a good place to leave it at this point. So. All right, I want to thank you both for coming on the Jewish One on a short notice. And your, your message is very powerful, very thank important, you. and we felt for the, to let our, all our viewers to know about it. So. Thank you very much and a lot of success to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you so much.